July 17, 1943. War and war crimes. Some say they go together like a horse and carriage. All sides are guilty of them, and in any case, isn't war a crime in and of itself? Well, no. First of all, there is such a thing as a just war in both legal and moral terms. Second of all, some belligerents do enforce that their soldiers follow the legal methods of war laid down in international covenants. Third of all, war puts the idea of what is criminal and not on its head. This week, we see how it is often down to single individuals, how their side prosecutes a war or occupation, as most fighting Ukrainians choose to fight the Nazis, and a few others choose to not be any better than the Nazis, General George S. Patton calls for his soldiers to carry out war crimes, Jews give up one of their own resistance fighters, and the struggle started by now fallen German resistance operatives is carried on by the RAF. Here's a word from the Time Ghost Army. Never forget, never give up, never surrender. Join the Time Ghost Army. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olsen. Last week, we saw German Führer Adolf Hitler give green light to the prioritized development and construction of a ballistic missile as a weapon of vengeance on the British. The French resistance lost one of its key leaders as Jean Moulin died after being tortured by the Gestapo, and the Polish army abroad and at home lost its leader, Wladyslaw Sikorsky, in a plane crash. Meanwhile, the Greek resistance united as the United Nations Alliance used them in their deception of the Axis powers that an invasion was pending in Greece rather than Italian Sicily. In Germany, Cologne was bombed for the third time in three days, leaving little behind but rubble, bodies and despair. This week sees more of the same. On the 13th, Aachen is raided by 373 RAF aircraft. They destroyed 2,927 buildings and damaged many more, including the town hall, police headquarters, a large number of factories, 16,828 residential flats, and the city's cathedral, constructed on the first Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne's order in the 9th century, where he is also buried. 745 people are injured and 294 die. On the 5th, 165 Halifax bombers attack the French town of Montbéliard, which has a large Peugeot motor factory. Only 30 bombs fall on the factory, and 600 end up destroying the town, injuring 336 and killing 123 civilians. In Italy, 295 Lancaster bombers raid Turin, injuring 914 and killing 792 on July 12th. On July 16, it is not bombs that fall on Italian defensive positions, but flyers saying, die for Mussolini and Hitler or live for Italy and for civilization. The text and accompanying propaganda radio broadcasts are hammering home that it is not the Italians' war. Millions of men, women and children, that is Italy, have everything to lose if this war continues. This is Hitler's war. Hitler uses Italy as a shield against the overwhelming superiority of the United Nations, which has been admitted even by the Axis bulletins. This means death, ruin and desolation for the Italians. Germany will fight to the last Italian. A message reinforced by the invasion of Sicily that began last week in the night from July 9 to 10. As we have seen in Indy's weekly coverage of the military war, the invasion goes mostly according to plan. The widespread transgressions and atrocities against Axis POW that you may have followed in Indy's coverage of the reconquest of Tunisia are mostly absent, but not completely. On Wednesday, July 14th, troops of the U.S. 180th Infantry Regiment take a small airfield five miles north of the small Sicilian town of Biscari. All that remain are some German snipers held up in the rubble until they too are driven out by Sherman tanks. Before the invasion, the men of the 45th Infantry Division, including the 180th Infantry Regiment, were addressed by George Patton himself. According to the commander of C Company of the 180th Regiment's 1st Battalion, Captain John T. Compton, they were told to kill devastatingly. Reportedly, 
Patton warned of white flag ruses and advised to kill the sons of a bitches when units surrender moments before their defeat. Now, the 180th took heavy losses in the first days, largely because of the snipers on the airfield. The men are on edge, looking for revenge. In a first incident, non-commissioned officer Sergeant Horace T. West oversees the transfer of 46 prisoners to the rear. Stripped of their shirts and shoes to discourage fleeing, the prisoners and their guards walk for 400 yards until West tells them to stop. He separates nine of them for interrogation. He borrows the Thompson machine gun from his first sergeant, who asks what West's intentions are. To shoot the sons of a bitches, is his answer. Turn around if you don't want to see, he says, as he starts to shoot the 37 remaining prisoners. After they fall down to the ground, some still gurgling in their own blood, West goes on to shoot them all once again, straight through the heart. A couple of hours later, still on the airfield runway, C Company Captain John T. Compton is asked by one of his men what they should do with 36 Italian prisoners, some of which are wearing civilian clothes. Have these snipers shot, Compton answers. While the Italians plead for their lives, Compton assembles a volunteer firing squad and they are killed. Commander of the Second Corps, Lieutenant General Omar Bradley, is responsible for these men. He rushes to tell Army Commander George Patton that roughly 70 POW had been murdered, but Patton isn't impressed. I told Bradley that it was probably an exaggeration, but in any case, to tell the officer to certify that the dead men were snipers or had attempted to escape or something, as it would make a stink in the press and would also make the civilians mad. However, they are dead, so nothing can be done about it. Bradley will not let go, though, and following an investigation by 45th Division, the perpetrators of the massacres will be tried. Compton will plead that he did commit the massacre, but that this was in line with Patton's orders. A court-martial will acquit him in October, after which he'll die in active duty on the Italian front in November. West is found guilty to premeditated murder, but his sentence is remitted in 1944, after which he's restored to active duty for the remainder of the war. And while the U.S. Army does at least try its war criminals, the Germans continue their institutionalized murder spree untried in the war with the partisans in the East. On July 10th, Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler circulated an order outlining how Hitler wished that the territories of the northern Ukraine and Russia center plagued by bandit activity are to be cleared of all their population. All able-bodied male civilians that can still be exploited for labor will be transferred to Fritz Saukel, who is in charge of the forced labor drive. The females can be put to work in the Reich. Once the population is deported or killed, an area will be declared a dead zone. Everyone in it will then be treated as a bandit, which means that they will be killed. A month from now, 16% of Belarus will already be declared a dead zone. On July 13th, the Germans launch Operation Hermann in the Nalubiki forest in western Belarus. Over the next couple of weeks, 60 Polish and Belarusian villages will be burned down. They take those who they think will yield them some free labor, between 21 and 25,000 people, and kill 4,280 civilians they consider worthless, mostly children and elderly people. Not only are these actions criminal, they also fail in their objective as the partisans continue escalating their war effort. On July 14th, General Pantelimeon Ponoramenko, leader of the Soviet partisans in Belarus, orders the start of Operation Rail War. 123 partisan units with roughly 100,000 fighters equipped with explosives and weapons are to derail as many German trains as possible over the entire Eastern Front. It's hard to come by exact numbers of the efficiency of the action, as German and Soviet sources heavily differ, but it's likely that during the first 24 hours, thousands of rail segments are destroyed. Among the Soviet partisan forces, you'll find many Jewish and non-Jewish Belarusians, Baltic people, Poles, and Ukrainians. In Soviet Ukrainian territory alone, there are in July an estimated 150,000 partisans fighting behind the front lines in coordination with the Red Army. While these men and women fight the Nazis to stop their genocidal war, some of their countrymen are fighting a genocidal war of their own. 
As we saw in the spring, Ukrainian nationalists of the Ukrainian Insurgent Army, the UPA, of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, OUN, have been cleansing Volhynia and eastern Galicia of its Polish inhabitants. Many of the now 20,000 UPA men had previously collaborated with the Nazis and volunteered to be muscle for the genocide of the Jews and anti-partisan activities, often directed at civilians of their own ethnicity. The hopes of the UPA to gain German support for independence has so far gone unfulfilled, which hasn't stopped them from continuing their terror activities. Actions that in turn has driven some ethnic Poles to also join the German police or the Soviet partisans or form their own self-defense units, which all in all has led to retaliatory murders of around 10,000 Ukrainian civilians in recent months. Now, this in turn boosted the UPA's recruitment drives and now in July the situation escalates into an all-out ethnic war. The Ukrainian insurgent army, albeit relatively small, has control of most of Volhynia, and ethnic Ukrainian civilians in the area continue to join their ranks. On the 9th of 11th to 12th of July 1943, UPA fighters attacked 167 villages and communities around Volhynia. The armed soldiers and civilians are told to kill all the servants of German and Russian imperialism in their nests. They go house to house, bed to bed, shooting, stabbing, and burning men, women, and children alike. Around 10,000 Poles are murdered during that one night alone. The violence and the cycle of escalation is far from over, but the Ukrainians declare victory, claiming that the Polish problem is basically resolved. And while they fantasize that they have solved their imaginary problems, the Nazis continue their genocide to solve their imagined Jewish question. Pursuant to Himmler's order to liquidate all remaining ghettos in Eastern Europe, the Nazis are trying to preempt any uprisings like we saw in Warsaw. One of the places they fear resistance in is the Vilnius ghetto. Here, the United Partisan Organization, FPO, operates relatively freely both inside and outside the ghetto in preparation to take the fight to their tormentors. In June, the Germans arrested two communist partisans in the ghetto. One of them, Kozlovsky, gave in to his interrogators and admitted knowing the leader of the United Partisan Organization, FPO, Yitzhak Wittenberg. On July 8th, the SS Sicherheitspolizei called for the arrest of Wittenberg. In a meeting with Jakob Gens, head of the ghetto, Wittenberg is arrested on July 15th, but resistance members free him during his transport to jail. Wittenberg calls for a mobilization of the Vilnius ghetto resistance forces and goes into hiding. Now, Gens is panicking, knowing that the Germans will enter the ghetto by force if Wittenberg is not arrested. Fearing liquidation, the Jewish police starts to search for the resistance leader. The fear of a retaliatory massacre spreads, and many of the Jewish public, even the communists, start to call for Wittenberg's arrest. On July 16th, he gives himself up. He lays down his weapons and simply walks into the ghetto. Gens delivers him to the Germans, who lock him up, but failed to properly search him. He's managed to smuggle in a vial of poison and is found dead the following morning. Not only has the FBO lost its leader, but it has become apparent that the majority of Jews in the Vilnius ghetto are unwilling, or rather too scared, to pick up arms against the Germans. The FBO decides to leave for the woods instead. And one week from now, the first 21 fighters will covertly make their way out of the ghetto to fight another day. And that is the trend in this war behind the lines. Resistance depends on the willingness of a few to risk everything for the greater good. One of them is a French Roman Catholic priest, Father Marie Benoit, who meets with Pope Pius XII on July 16th. Father Marie Benoit and his companions expect the Italian front to collapse under Allied pressure any moment, which will cause thousands of Jewish refugees in Italian-occupied southeastern France to fall into German hands. Until now, they have escaped the Nazis, as the Italians have not acquiesced German demands to hand over Jews for murder. So, Father Marie Benoit pitches a plan to bring eight to 10,000 foreign Jews from the Italian occupation zone to Italy proper. While the Pope promises to look into it, this large-scale plan will never be realized. 
Why? Well, if you haven't already, to find out, you should take a look at our four-part miniseries examining the Vatican's complex role in this war and the Pope's reticence to take action to stop the genocides. In any case, instead, Father Marie Bonnois will take it upon himself to smuggle as many Jews into freedom as he can without the Vatican's support. Until the war ends, he and a small group of helpers will manage to save some 4,000 human beings. He will evade capture by the Gestapo and survive the war. In Germany this week, other resistance members do not have that fortune. On July 13th, two more White Rose members, Alexander Schmorell and Professor Kurt Huber, are executed by guillotine in the Stadlein prison in Munich. Their crime, as all the White Rose members, was distributing anti-Nazi leaflets. But while the authors perish, their message does not. This month, July 1943, the British RAF, on top of the bombs they drop, will let fly over cities like Cologne, Frankfurt and Hamburg five million copies of the sixth White Rose leaflet, written mostly by Kurt Huber, with the added title, A German Leaflet, the Manifesto of the Students of Munich. Freedom and honor. For 10 long years, Hitler and his comrades have bled dry, thrashed, twisted these two glorious German words to the point of disgust, as only dilettantes can cast the highest value of a nation before the swine. What counts for them as freedom and honor, they have amply shown over ten years of destruction of all material and intellectual freedom, of all moral substance in the German nation. The terrible bloodbath they have executed and continue to execute every day in the name of freedom and honor of the German nation across all of Europe has opened the eyes of even the stupidest German. The German name remains desecrated for all times if the German youth does not finally arise, revenge and atone together, crush its tormentors and establish a new intellectual Europe. Take heart, my people. The beacons are alight. Our nation is on the verge of rising up against the enslavement of Europe through national socialism in the new devout breakthrough of freedom and honor. Never forget. Mm-hmm.